friends, uh, as you know, we have been uh, discussing uh, 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 Clifford audits uh, the American playwright and uh, that is all in general and uh, certain points are really telling that, that Professor Bajaj has, uh, you know, uh, presented to us and uh, uh, she has to now uh, extend the argument further to, to, to take up certain texts where uh, uh, Clifford audits would be seen as uh, presenting a play uh, involving the audience and, and the very act of uh, writing uh, about the theater. So, uh, I request Professor Bajaj to uh, continue with the previous point uh, regarding, you know, the text and the stories and whatever he has to offer on the stage. Yes, thank you. So, I was discussing Odette's, um, uh, you know, technique as a playwright also. And, uh, but be before we do that, I'd actually like to begin with uh, Harold Clerman's quote on Odette's and Odette's characters as uh, Clerman saw them. And um, to quote, uh, Clerman says, what crushes Odette's people is not simply the economic situation, the depression, but the temper of the society as a whole of which the depression of the 30s was only an episode, a wounding symptom. We are still under mortal pressure of every sort, something we should be sharply reminded of in the present epoch of confusion, lethargy, affluence, fear and trembling. Unquote. Now, if we just look at this quote, we know that what, what, are, what is Odette's world like and what are uh, what are these characters like that we meet? You see, it's it's this present epoch of confusion, of lethargy, of affluence on the other hand, fear and trembling that actually uh, in a way uh, define the period. That, you know, there was confusion and lethargy on one hand and confusion is at the center of the play that I'd be discussing today, Waiting for Lefty. And here the confu conflu confusion exists. There is fear and there is trembling. It's as if uh, a strike is going to break out any moment. And yet there is affluence on the other hand that is suggested by, you know, people who, who are making big money and people who are uh, progressing in society. So, you know, for an Odette's play, you, we need to understand that these are the different strains that exist and he's able to simultaneously talk about them. So that while he shows fear and trembling in one place, he will show the confusion of the people in other places that you know they're totally confused they don't know which way to go you know that's also another it's not as if they are aware they're not very aware and you know they're very easily taken in and there are then there are there are there are these people who are deceiving them all the time so you know how to come out of this sort of a muck so to speak or how to come out of this kind of a quandary is something that an Odette's play uh, brings forth so uh, as we go ahead, I would like to uh, discuss today, uh, you know, as an example of Odette's playwright skills, the play Waiting for Lefty, which was, uh, you know, which came together in 1935 as a part of the sixth play collection. And, uh, you know, it, it is actually, this play is a representation of the unionization of taxi drivers uh, in America. The play ends with slogans such as strike, strike, strike. Right. And this is a picture that you might be able to see and the actual scenes are being projected to us and how uh, this kind of um, strike really took place. So uh, to tell you uh, in, in nutshell, this play Waiting for Lefty is actually based on the context of this play is that it is based on the strike of 1934 in February that took place in New York, which was called, which is famously called the New York Taxi Drivers uh, Strike. And the play actually captures the restlessness and the commotion of the time and the confusion that existed among the taxi drivers at the time. So this 40 day old strike of New York City taxi drivers was one of the factors actually that later on forced the Roosevelt government's announcement, you know, of a relief measures for laborers as a part of their new deal policy that they were that they were making in the depression years, you know, to um, uh, to elevate the conditions of different sectors. And it is at this time also that the Se Social Security Act was put in place in 1935 that uh, guaranteed unemployment insurance to people and gave them some pension uh, benefits as well. Uh, there was the Na National Labor Relations Act, which actually guaranteed, uh, you know, workers to be able to unite themselves in trade unions in 1935. So, 
this is the backdrop against which we need to put this play. So, you know, 1934, the, uh, the strike of the New York taxi drivers and this was basically because the government had put up a kind of a tax, additional tax and that tax actually took away the tips that the drivers were able to make. Now, it is also very interesting to understand how uh, the New York City drivers uh, went on strike because you see 1929 there were so many cabs in the uh, in the city and they were all in use and they were all bustling. The place was full because it was still the period of the shining America and the American dream. But 1929, the moment the you know you hit you hit the depression decade in the 1930s, the cab drivers didn't know where to find money because there were more cabs than they were takers, right? So uh, there was this kind of uh, you know uh, there was this glut of. Uh, taxi drivers in the city and that led to also this kind of uh, restlessness among them. So, uh, the depression has worked in so many different ways and this then is projected uh, in the play Waiting for Lefty by Clifford Odets. So, this is the context of the play. I just thought it is important to understand where he's taken the narrative from. He's taken it from the 1934 taxi driver strike. Now, that is that becomes the basis of his play. Now, let's look at the play itself. Now, in the prologue to the play, uh, you know, the taxi drivers are seen in their union meeting and it's interesting how he uses the stage also because you find that all the, so this is the prologue where the taxi um, union is meeting, the drivers are meeting in their union meeting and there is the union leader, uh, Harry Fat, who dissuades, who is actually dissuading the members of the uh, union to go on a strike. He says that don't take that way because now we have a good man, you know, uh, at the helm of affairs. Uh, the president who's taking care of us and he's a good man and he's very bothered about the workers so don't go to the that don't go on a strike now this is uh, it's very interesting how this play actually uh, puts together frames these different scenes because the prologue is uh, in the prologue the characters that we meet they are actually there in the background so there is a an uplifted stage uh, in the background where these characters continue to sit the union members including the union leader harry fat and in the foreground then of the stage the new scenes are enacted and you know they are somewhat connected so one of the for instance, one of the union member has a wife at home and that scene would be played out then on the front part of the stage and in the backdrop, you still have the union uh, member sitting there as, as a backdrop of the play. So, you know how this keeps and otherwise each play and we were discussing, is this a kind of a tightly knit narrative, you know, does it have a plot, a story that develops in the course of the scene? No, it's just a set of scenes which are patched together, scenes from the lives of workers, scenes from the lives lives of uh, these uh, drivers who once had a life or who think of a life that they had. So, you know, they are tangentially related then. There is as if, you know, there, there are parallel lives that are being projected. So, you find that these are scenes from different people's lives. So, you have seen one where you have, for instance, Joe and Edna and uh, you know their 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 stories panned out. Actually, it, it might do us well if we go exactly to um, uh, you know the the kind of synopsis. If I just look at the scene and tell you, so scene one, you see a conversation between Joe and Edna, his wife, and you know that they the, and this scene highlights their financial problems. Joe's pay cuts and his inability to pay house rents and installments for the furniture. The furniture is taken away from their house, and the wife is ready to leave him and divorce him. So, that is one scene. Now, the second scene actually shifts to, a lab, shifts to a lab assistant, Miller, who is offered a higher salary by his employer, Fate, uh, for, you know, working in a, a factory that, presu uh, that produces poisonous gases for chemical wars. Now, Miller has seen his uh, brothers die in wars, in the First World War. So, he is tempted by Fate, you know, giving him higher salary. The more he says no, Fate keeps increasing the, cre increasing the price uh, and he says, okay, I'll give you $40, okay, I'll give you more. So, just for working because he has talent and he has the know-how of working in a factory that produ produces chemical war, uh, uh, I mean gas for chemical war and finally you find that Miller shuts it and he quits it and he punches fate in his face. Now, there is no connection 
between these two scenes and yet there is a deeper connection this is what life is in america and so you know it's like a kaleidoscope the things the, the the scenes keep shifting and they seem to fall in a pattern and you know together they make sense now scene three shows us for instance a kind of a love affair between a couple now they refuse to acknowledge the external world of their uh, you know of joblessness and privation and they continue to dance in oblivion and they decide that oh why think about it let's dance and enjoy the moment now that's another way that's another approach to life taken by characters who you know who are in love and they know that uh, the outside world is da- daunting um Florence knows that Sid is poor and they, if they marry then they will land up like Joe and Edna fighting and ready to split and divorce. So they, they want to live in that moment and they decide to just live in oblivion and dance the night out. So you see this is again another third scene. The scene fourth then shows us returning to the union and Harry Fat this time has come to deceive the drivers of the union to tell them to force them to not carry on with the strike and he brings a, a, a worker with a false identity entity and says that this person was there in the um, strike of Philadelphia and he's telling you the story and how they suffered and how you should not you know go ahead with it finally the union realizes that it's one of their own uh, uh, person you know a rat really who's uh, tried to break unions in the past and who has again tried so he's caught and the truth is finally uh, brought forward that he was this is a way of the union leader to split or to uh, divide the union and to cause fractions uh, in it. Now scene 5 is a conversation between two doctors and where one of them Benjamin is sacked by the hospital because he's a Jew. Now remember I spoke about uh, uh, Odette's having Jewish parentage. So he's also consciously telling us how society works at, in terms of racial segregation and racial prejudice. So because Benjamin is a Jew, he is uh, sacked by the hospital and somebody else is, takes his place who's more a, who's incompetent, but you know Benjamin is thrown out. Now Benjamin becomes a jobless doctor and finally takes to taxi driving. So in the union, people, what kind of lives they've had, where they come from, this is how the play actually brings them f- together. And their lives and their stories are projected, even though they may not uh, directly... Uh, you know relate with one another now the question is where is this lefty that is spoken of in the beginning waiting for lefty that's the play's title almost reminding us of Beckett's waiting for Godot but waiting for Godot comes much later this is in 1935 that uh, um, Odette writes the play waiting for lefty but that is very true you know the metaphor of waiting for lefty is very similar to waiting for godo in that sense because lefty will never return now uh, lefty costello was actually the a fierce leader of the union and the uh, we the last scene actually brings us uh, the, uh, you know the news that uh, lefty costello has been shot dead with the sole intention of depriving the union of an effective leadership so he has been shot dead by uh, those in power because they don't want the union to be to get an effective leadership so so all sorts of tricks and strategies are employed and this man is finally shot dead and he never returns and yet the play ends with as a result of this news that they get to know that uh, Lefty Costello has been shot dead the resolve is strengthened and a gate who is you know all fire at the end and is giving us the propaganda he, te- he says at the end and I quote we'll die for what is right put fruit trees where our ashes are and the members of the uh, group of the union finally begin to chant strike 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 so that's how the you know in in nutshell this is what the play is about uh, you know how it puts these scenes together in such a play uh, you know uh, some sometimes you know poems and uh, lyrics and songs can really help and that's what brest did you know uh, right. th- these situations cannot be evoked easily on the stage and yet he makes them interesting because of the, as you said, the pun- use of punch lines. Right. So they, they, they are, they are the soul of the play rests. Right. So what right. about, uh, has he also attempted some kind of a poem uh, to be presented there? No, no, there are no poetic, li- it is a very lyrical play. So there is a mm. lyrical quality in the play itself, you know, mm. like the slogans, the chants. And yet there are no poems or songs in the play. And yet there is a kind of a lyrical quality about it because of the dialect, you know, of people speaking in that dialect. Also, has the di- each dialect has its own lyrical quality. Mm-hmm. So, you know, with these lyrical qualities, it almost seems like it's, it's, it's a very racy play. Mm-hmm. It's not like um, a slogan low read in that sense. For instance, you know, there is uh, uh, the wife Edna tells Joe at one point, you're working for the company, uh, Says uh, she says to me, 
जो यू एंट वर्किंग फॉर मी और द फैमिली नो मोर Hmm. So you know the way this kind grew, of language, this kind of language, hmm. you know, she, you ain't working for me or the family no more. Hmm. You're working for the company, and hmm. yet there is a punchline hmm. that he says, "I'm working for you," and he, she says, "You're not working for me or the family. You're working for the company and for hmm. your boss." Hmm. At another place, she says, "Your boss is making," and I quote, "Your boss is making suckers out of you boys every minute. You, uh, yes, suckers out of your wives and poor innocent kids who'll grow up with crooked spines and sick bones." Sure, I see it in papers how good. orange juice is for kids but damn it our kids get cold one uh, one on top of the other they look like little ghosts just see how many ideas and they are all put together, together. and some That's kind of mean. meaning comes it's out kind, hmm. it's like you know so many ideas that hmm. uh, he's he he is uh, it, and he says that and you know she's able to say so much in just a sentence that i i know how good orange juice is for kids but damn it our kids never get how do i get that for our kids and you know she says uh, and and she almost cries in front of the husband where she says my the daughter once asked me what a grapefruit looks like so i cannot uh, the life our life is for everyone jo she says so you know there is this cry and there is this uh, emotion which drives this play further and see the images of a fruits of orange juice yeah. uh, all those things you know start signifying something different than what is being presented on the stage yeah hmm. and similarly jo for instance i'll quote another extract from her uh, jo says don't tell me red you know what we are the black and blue boys hmm. we've been kicked around so long we are black and blue from head to toes just see the the, the, the playfulness playfulness of hmm. language hmm. you know because he's been targeted because hmm. you know as i said there was this fear of red so hmm. to speak or uh, the red boys uh, in the decade so he says don't tell me red i've been in the i've been to war you know and i've i've been to war and fought for the country so i don't know red but i know that we are the black and blue boys because we have been kicked around we are black and blue from head to toes but i guess anyone who says straight out he don't like it he's a red boy to the leaders of the union and and then he says what's this crap about going home to hot suppers i'm asking to you your faces how many is got hot suppers to go home to anyone sure of the next meal raise your hand that's why we are talking strike to get a living wage this is a modern coin and yeah. in a way because so many things so, so many clusters occur yeah the, the, the clusters of situations clusters of trees of 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 the and and the patterns right and of words and of of people's situations you know mm-hmm. this is the joe who's come to speak to the union meeting and is talking to the union members but once he goes back home he's a very tender husband and the wife is obviously very shrewd because of the conditions and so you know uh, clifford odets also projects is very pro at projecting very tender love scenes mm-hmm. and he's able to present love and uh, by by being able to present love he's also been uh, is also shows you know there is a kind of a pain attached to it the the that the inability to uh, be able to love in fulfilling terms in such situations mm-hmm. so there is this pain and uh, uh, because there is this absence of love that should have been and you know and there are only these moments when he projects this love in in its in agony so there is uh, there is agony as as well as enthusiasm in the plays you know they are very fiery in that sense and there is the and uh, in fact lerman once called uh, odets a romantic uh, of sorts he says he is downright a romantic who gushes with joy at moments and then uh, goes into melancholy so and one doesn't see any pessimism here one doesn't see any cynicism yeah. there nothing is possible in fact everybody seems to be full of life yes, full of right. enthusiasm and and an awareness Mm, you know a, there is agony there is pain there is mm. absolutely uh, there is an awareness of the horrible situation that they are living in mm. you know at one point when uh, harry fat the union leader who's trying to dissuade them to go on strike uh, you know he he says that uh, you know that uh, that he asserts th- that roosevelt's administration is working in the interest of the workers and he says that um, and i quote all we workers got a good man behind us now he works day and night to which the response he gets from the uh, from the union members is for who that is the question yes yes he says mm. you know when he says he works day and night mm. and the response he gets from the audience is for who mm. not for us mm. so you know that he's probably working day and night but for another section of society not for us mm. so uh, interestingly and again you know the uh, the play is projected in the manner that in the background there is a um, higher stage where the union members sit in the foreground these stories go on you know of joe and edna of all these characters and then there is a space where 
the members of the union that is the drivers are together right which is sort of in the dark so it almost becomes an extension of the audience so you know there are people who are sitting on the stage who from where like for who is given by the audience mm-hmm. not the audience that is there to watch the play but the audience that is part of the union meeting in the play so there are there are group of people who are sitting who are a part of who are drivers who are a part of a union but the union leaders are on the stage is it suggested somewhere that these plays were presented before the working class in in, in the in the urban sense no actually it is not uh, it wasn't presented before the working class at all it was presented for uh, at one place clerman says that you know the people who came to watch uh, odets plays were not workers or drivers they mm. were ordinary people who had come to just watch plays and yet when they went back they had they had fire in them they wanted to discuss questions and they were full of life lower middle class thinking right. people teachers that doctors. is not very clearly mentioned and perhaps there there can be an another study done on it as to who was the targeted audience but yes he was talking about ordinary people who and taking deep inspiration from the events that were unfolding you know there were many strikes at the time uh, for instance i'll tell you uh, when um, uh, harry fat is trying to dissuade the workers uh, from going on a strike he actually uh, you know tells them that look at um, uh, you know look at the look at what happened to other strike people you know and i'll quote uh, if you if the if you can look at the str- screens uh, he tries to scare them by narrating tales of failed strikes as he says uh, right at the beginning and i quote look at the textile strike out like lions and in like lambs take the san francisco tie up starvation and broken heads unquote so you see this is the picture that we know that there is already been so this this decade was a decade of strikes and protests and processions so there were san francisco strikes in philadelphia in san francisco and you know the view that is being given that all of them have been broken in that sense that uh, they that these people went in like lions but came out like lambs so there is starvation and broken heads there is violence that uh, that they had to face and this is the environment in which then uh, clifford odets is really writing uh, this play of his and that's the essence of uh, his sort of drama that we find uh, in this play in fact if we uh, you know as i mentioned there is this kind of uh, an alternative narrative of worship of materialism that is there which is not there in waiting for lefty because waiting for lefty is deeply uh, about uh, uh, on one hand the union uh, workers but also at, uh, about people who have been doctors and chemists and they have left their jobs and turned into taxi drivers but on when we enter their lives then we understand this kind of worship of materialism which is also evident in his play the golden boy as i said earlier it because it dramatically captures you know this kind of um, uh the the mindset of the growing uh, uh you know people and he says uh, at you know this about these uh, expensive cars he says that the protagonist admits that those cars are poisons in my blood and then uh, another uh, picture of this you know which is uh, where, you know which is presented here you have uh, in awaken singh as i said that the mantra of success so these are some of the uh, portions that are important in understanding clifford odets um, Uh, over i think would you uh, uh, comment on the uh, uh, you know selection of characters men women or what kind of characters does he uh, you know present on the stage so these are actually these characters uh, at least the um, the drivers who are there in waiting for lefty and for instance joe and enna you know they carry this kind of an innocence you know they they like for instance joe doesn't know how to go about it there's a lot of confusion while edna suggests that you know she should he should go and uh, join the uh, join the strike and ha- make others also join the strike joe says that one pa- one man can't do anything you know and i'm trying my best so you know he seems to be living in this world of false narratives and he doesn't seem to uh, really make sense of it and 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 there is a kind of innocence that he has that you know he's been driven to work because of his family so i think characters have a sense of innocence and there are certain and characters have a sense of integrity as against a set of other characters who are all full of ambition 
and success and they don't bother for instance uh, where you have the scene of uh, uh, the chemical gas being produced the poisonous gas being produced there Miller is, has a sense of integrity and he realizes that he is adding to that kind of a scientific endeavor that is going to lead to more wars mm -hmm. but his employer is clearly not bothered he says there are uh, instructions from the top that we uh, and it doesn't bother us we can't be sentimental people you know if we are sentimental then uh, we there will be no big business in you know to name anything so big business business uh, uh, is <laughs> present precisely because we are uh, you know we are insensitive to such things so by that logic variety of characters one one character is innocent another is amusing the third doesn't know and all those things are, are this the variety there are two broad character uh, you know characters one who belong to the realm of you know they are either so there are there are there are dips and then there is this kind of a surge but uh, there are one set of characters who are uh, who want to change their conditions and who want a better life for themselves uh, and there there are varieties within them you know the simple uh, minded or the uh, the courageous and the ones leading the front and then there are the other side, on the other side there are those who are who have taken up the cause of materialism and worship materialism and money and success and have entered the fray in that sense so uh, there are two really two sets of characters i would say if one were to divide them one who worship materialism and have been totally subsumed by that logic and the other that uh, that, that that are the victim of this kind of life and um, uh, have a sense of integrity and innocence and not trying to um, fight for their uh, rights in that sense. What about uh, depiction of deprivation, uh, depiction of uh, joblessness, uh, depiction of hopelessness? Yes. So, you know, it's, it's uh, in Waiting for Lefty, it is most poignant when you have uh, Edna tell uh, Joe, for instance, that don't wake the children because I don't want them to know I, that they slept on an empty stomach. You know, so the, these are those pictures of deprivation that, you know, the children have gone without food, without meals and that the, she made them, she said, don't wake them up for they will know that they slept on empty stomach then. Uh, so in that sense, you know, these are these are the pictures that that shock you and that that take you along that uh, Joe has been working on a sh on shift after shift and he's not been able to. She says that his wife uh, says that, you know, this will only bring beans home and nothing else. So these are pictures that, you know, they have been there is a there is a horrible reality out there and they are terrified by that reality their furniture it also in a way is about that kind of america which is which is surviving on installments you know uh, when their furniture is taken away from the house wife says that well uh, edna says here that you know we could not pay the installments so it's almost like all the good things that they could uh, they could procure or uh, that gave them the semblance of progress they were procured on installments so which means it wasn't really true so they were made to believe that they could pick up anything they like with zero money and that they would be paying installments but the truth is that uh, all of it slips out of slips from their hands because it's not real how do you conclude your argument about this playwright i think it's a very interesting playwright and must be focused on and because he has had a real big influence he's been a big influence on arthur miller and the rest of the playwrights uh, in america post 1930s uh, he's he's been able to innovate the uh, stage very well but beyond that he's he can uh, squeeze in so much in a very short, small space so i think uh, that kind of depth of uh, understanding and knowledge is conveyed by simple words and sentences you know he doesn't get philosophical anywhere or psychologically uh, or doesn't go into the depths of psychology or anything he's just talking simple ordinary speech as people speak and yet there is enough fodder out there i'd say so he's able to squeeze in so many dimensions in his work particularly uh, the the america the unsettling america of the 1930s comes across through his plays very well so friends uh, <clears throat> we come to the uh, close of the discussion and uh, it has been about uh, the, the the play uh, the, the the plays the drama uh, in in the first uh, half of the 20th century and uh, this revolved around the economic social problems and uh, it was very meaningful and this kind of a play uh, would not die until you know situations improve and people are able to maintain their innocence the way this this playwright also suggests that should happen Thank you.